And it was like, swoosh! And then he was like, kill, 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 kill. Oh, there he is, whap! And I was like, I mean, it was like a five second delay between seeing that fish first boil and having him come back. And, and, ben, and ben never flinched, my sage rep. Right. He just sat there and took it. Well, I'm a fishing guide in northern Michigan. Um, I've been coming down to the White River now for, I think this is either year eight or nine. That's all I do is I fish. Um, I spend most of the fall, summer, spring, about everything fishing, working, guiding, and actually Arkansas kind of fell into a time of year that there isn't much to do in Michigan, and that's how I ended up down here. But it's my full time, it's what I do. I got as many days a year as I can. Um, and see it happening for the foreseeable future. So I started fly fishing when I was 14 years old, I believe is the first time I went with a few friends in Grayling, Michigan. Um, that's when I first kind of cut my teeth and I spent just a week up there fishing. But the next year rolled around and uh, I got up there a bunch. My friends had just gotten their driver's license. They were 16, I was 14. We drove up there and fished a bunch. And we went it off and off and off and very frequently. And the next year, the guy who owned the fly shop up there, Rusty Gates, offered us jobs. He saw how into it we were, how much, he's, we, how much time we were spending up there. And he actually offered both my friend and I a job. And I came up for the summer and that's where it started. Um, I spent summers in Grayling all into my, until I started college. And I spent a few years in Montana then. And then came back to Grayling around 21 years old. When I was 21, I moved to Traverse City and met Russ Madden and Kelly Gell because he owned a fly shop at that point that was a mile or two from my house. And that's really when the evolution of streamer fishing came to me, was through Russ and Kelly. I'd been doing a lot of floating lines, weighted flies, fishing smaller rivers. Um, when I was introduced to Russ, I started fishing drift boats, sink tips, aggressive, more aggressive, uh, really covering water, prospecting. And with that came influences from Mark Sadati, who came in from the East Coast fishing from, for striped bass with big bait fish patterns. When we saw the, the production those eight inch flies had, it really opened our eyes. We were seeing the fish that we never saw in our small rivers come into the fly. And that was because it was the, the big bait fish pattern they hadn't seen. When I first moved to Traverse City, we were throwing four inch flies. That's right at the beginning of the circus peanut. And I remember seeing the first few days I threw that circus peanut, I saw a different caliber of fish than I had ever seen coming out of the wood pile. Um, it wasn't the 16, 17, 18, 19 inch fish. It was 22, 23, 24 inches. Um, and I've talked with Kelly about it. And he said the same thing. When the first times he took that circus peanut out and started fishing it, it blew him away. And that was that bigger size. Um, when we hit eight inches, we saw the same thing. It was just the next size. Uh, bites became more infrequent, but the quality of bites made it worth the, worth the effort. Saw his head come out right there. <laughs> you gotta watch the language. that first look at that fish when they first come out and not knowing what's going to show up when you throw your fly in a certain area. I think that's what keeps us all going. It's you never know what's next. I've seen things out here. I've seen things in Michigan that you don't know and you never really gather. Um, some of the incidents I've had down here, I remember real clear and I can still see that fish as it came and I still don't know how big they are. And I think that's what we're always looking for all the time, and that's what keeps you going, is those little flickers that happen once, twice a year. If you're out there a couple hundred days, you might have it happen once or twice a year. And that's what you're always there for. You know, I, I fish a lot. I sort a lot of 17 to 22 inch fish, but there's always those ones that you don't see, that you, you, you see come to this boat side, that never grab and you just wonder. And I've seen some down here that, yeah, that, that, that leave that impression and you're always looking for that one fish. 
And that's what does it. Favorite streamers. Um, when I tie, I tie along a different line. I'm looking for a color, a profile, a certain swim action, but I I don't get too worked up over which pattern. You know, the double deceivers, the deer hair stuff. I fish more deceivers because I think they're easier pass um, and easier for them to employ good action to the fly. So I fish a lot of deceivers. The ones I tie, the ones you fit tie, they all work good. That's a big thing. I like things that are neutrally buoyant on the stall as well. Sometimes. There's times of year where I'll switch through a lot of flies. It's, it's more action. I like to dying bait fish a lot of times, especially in this 50 some degree water. Um, when it's colder and we deal with this a lot in Michigan, you know, if, if it's not jigging, it's not as effective. There are certain times of year where you need the lead eyes, some weight in the front to swim it up and down. In Michigan, the standard circus peanut stuff, the krakens, the sculpins, the you know, leech type patterns really are, are extremely effective up there. We're fishing small, clear rivers with somewhat selective fish. So every, you know, when, when you ask what's your favorite streamer, it's all situational. Um, every situation calls for a different fly. Pace of current matters. Um, type of structure, you know, what you're fishing, that really determines which fly you should be running. And I think people have a tendency to fall in love with pattern A, B, or C and stick with it too much when they're overlooking what they should be doing based on water conditions. I think from a fishing perspective, what a lot of people fail to do that can help them, there's really two things. One thing is looking into the water, and I don't mean looking at your fly, looking around your fly. You know, um, a lot of times, we caught a fish this morning that I saw its head pop out from the bank. If I'm looking at my fly, I'm not going to see that. But when I look at that corner, I'm looking eight feet behind the fly, and all of a sudden I see a head come out over sand, most people don't pick that up. And if you don't see that, you don't work your fly back all the way. By seeing that, that allows you to stick with it and, and get more of these fish to come to the fly. Uh, I think that's really overlooked. It's a trained eye thing, too. It takes time. Um, look for something moving. Look for a shadow. Look for a color change in the bottom. A lot of times those are your indicators that something is behind you. A lot of people are like, I don't know what I saw, you know, but something was different. And that's, you know, when you're staring into the water eight hours a day and you're not seeing anything, not seeing anything, not seeing anything, and then you're like, I don't know, that was weird, that was different. Well, that's usually a fish. First fly I ever tied was probably a Marabou streamer because I had about a $30 Regal kit with terrible materials, a terrible vise, and terrible hooks. And I threw some stuff together. <laughs> and I think we caught something on it at some point. I really started tying with dry flies and I tied dry flies for years. When I was 15 I started tying for a fly shop in Grayling, Michigan, Gates Asaba Lodge and that's kind of where I went. So I was on the dry fly thing for a lot of years. I got into streamer tying oh down the road as my fishing expanded and I started fishing more of the shoulder seasons that weren't just your typical dry fly season. And that kind of started it. I'd say the first flies we tied, I tied some, you know, I, I tied a lot of double bunnies when that first came. I tied some big deer hair head double bunny stuff. Um, and we got on circus peanuts really quick because some of my friends worked with Russ down on PM Lodge, so that didn't last long and we were flipping those around. And that was really the start of the bigger stuff. When Mark came and started throwing those bucktails, we would throw those and he would leave us a few each year. <laughs> and that was the inspiration behind all the big bait fish patterns. When you start getting into the bigger flies, it's really when you have to start thinking about how you're tying them. When you get into the bigger flies, weight becomes more important. Amount of material and bulk becomes more important. The materials you select is very important. The weight of the hooks matters because all of that will help or hurt your ability to cast that fly. I kind of, one thing I do really look at in flies is the hook selection and I'm I kind of like somewhere in between. I want a good gap and I want, eh, not the finest wire, but pretty fine wire. Um, brown trout eat differently than other fish. Brown trout swipe and injure, um, which leads us to needing lighter wire hooks that penetrate quicker versus like a muskie or a pike who has teeth that really locks down on the bait and holds it. You know, you can run a heavy gauge hook because you're going to get enough force to penetrate that when a fish is going to grab it and lock it in its mouth. When we're fishing these brown trout, most of the strikes we're hooking up on is the first injury blow, which means they usually swipe and knock it. So we're trying to get them on that knock. 
usually means if you have a lighter wire hook that penetrates better, you're gonna catch more fish using that. That's one thing I do watch. Other than that, doesn't matter that much. <laughs> Get it out there, wing it out there, fish it well, and it'll work. In tying, I, I end up using a lot of bucktail and schlopping. Um, I've always been a fan of the long schlopping feathers. I've been using those rooster saddles from whiting forever. Um, the long, thick feathers give you a nice little wiggle into the tail. They are light, they weigh nothing, and you get a lot of action out of them. The same reason I use bucktail. Um, and that's tying the bigger bait fish patterns, which I like on these bigger rivers. I use a lot of brushes, the EP brushes. I use, um, and I still use a lot of bunny and, and marabou in there too. You get a lot of action. When you're fishing weighted flies, jigging, you can get a lot of swim out of some of those materials that soak up a lot of water. They're just not as easy to fish on the big river system when you're doing the 50, 60, 70 foot cast some days. The future of streamer fishing. Future streamer fishing, I think it's more crossover. We're getting closer and closer to lures. Um, and I think you're gonna see that progression and I think you're gonna see more of it. I think we're gonna bring in more things from the spinning, spin fishing world into fly fishing. That's where it'll really go. The numbers will grow. More people will do it. It's kinda, it's geared for the 30 something who can't sit still. Streamer fishing's perfect for that guy and we're, there's more and more of those people every day. And more and more of them are, have got decent jobs and they're making some money and they're going fishing. Um, and this is a style a lot of them like. You know, one of the things being down here has taught me, and, and it's taken years of being here, is how complex some of this stuff is that happens on the white. And it's 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 really been pretty funny this year because I've I've worked with Chad for a bunch of years, and now I'm meeting some of the other guys that are working. You know, and and and. It baffles me. These guys know this water, and they know this water better than I'll ever hope to know this water. Um, I've spent some time with Brock Dixon and Jason Lloyd, and I mean, there are some very good local fishermen. Chad, Brock, Jay, I mean, these guys are good, and there's you, there are these people in all these locations that know this river, or know their river. Um, and use that you know those are the guys that are going to be you know they're the ones that that can you know that will teach you how to fish um the local knowledge and, and knowledge on the water here on any of these rivers that's irreplaceable that's something that that i think people should appreciate more and the more you fish the more you learn to appreciate those things it'll grow and we're going to find more fisheries that it's good on more fisheries it are good big streamer rivers it's just going to take time and it's going to take you know the anglers to get out there and do it but we're breeding them we got a lot of anglers now we got more streamer fishermen now than ever and you got guys who just like to streamer fish hell they go you know they come down here and streamer fish for trout and then they fish for trout in michigan and switch over to the bass when the bass fishing is good and switch to muskies when the muskies fishing good they don't care they're going to streamer fish and i think we're just going to see more of that more opportunities more options more stuff to do and try um, so that's good. I think, you know, the more we can expand and spread out and see different things and learn different things, it's going to help everyone. Uh, so that's exciting.